thoughts on uh, answering the question, is there life beyond Earth? Hi, I'm Jim Green, NASA's chief scientist. Thanks so much for inviting me to spend a few minutes and talk at the NASA Astrobiology Science Forum. The forum, of course, is all about the origin, evolution, and distribution and future of astrobiology, which to me has been a really important topic all during my career. Now, I became the head of planetary science in 2006, and at that time, the NASA Astrobiology Program was managed at, out of NASA headquarters by John Rommel. But John left by 2008. We brought in Dr. Mary Wojtek, who's been managing the program ever since. Now, of course, part of the program has been the Institute, but Mary has had a number of other really exciting things that we've been investing in astrobiology over these many years. In this session on the future of astrobiology, to me, its future is really all about answering the question, is there life beyond Earth? That is what we absolutely have to do. Now, when I started in 2006, it was really all about following the water strategy. Soon, we began thinking about, well, uh, once we land Curiosity on Mars, we have an opportunity to have one of the most sophisticated spacecraft roving on that surface, teasing out the chemistry and everything about uh, the evolution of the planet that we can from the surface. Then we decided, hey, we need to be looking for a habitable environment. We need to be looking for complex organics. Perhaps we'll be able to see amino acids and build our way all the way up to potentially RNA and DNA. This we called the ladder of life. Of course, we're not gonna be able to do that with curiosity, but the basic concept of working our way up that ladder, making ever increasing more complicated and sophisticated measurements is really the key. Now, what we know about astrobiology has evolved over these last several years in a major significant way. We now are looking at the size of complex organic material. How big can these organic molecules come together in a random process without the aid of life? And we find out that perhaps as high as 150 atomic mass units may be that limit. We now fly our mass spectrometers well above 150 AMU. So astrobiology is teaching us each and every step some new techniques and capabilities that we're gonna need to answer that question, are we alone? You know, concepts of looking at trace gases. During this time, I was head of planetary observations of methane were being published by Mike Muma and his group. Mike's been a major part of the Astrobiology Institute for years, and these have been absolutely exciting results. And of course, methane could be generated biologically, uh, in addition to abiotic sources too. But it's a good opportunity to really follow these trace gases. Other things that are happening too, with Mars 2020 launched in July of next year and then landed seven months later, coring rock and allowing us to bring that rock back to Earth before the end of this next decade will be a gold mine of information. We now know that life is important for the generation of many minerals. There are 4,700 minerals here on Earth, and 300 of them can only be made by life. Perhaps we'll get lucky. Perhaps we'll see in this rock record, not only a little part of the geological record of Mars over time, but perhaps over a time when there was rapid climate change and when Mars may have been habitable. Tremendously exciting opportunity. With Cassini around Titan, really uncovering and looking below the clouds, seeing that Titan is the only other body in the solar system that has liquid on the surface, allowing us to think about metabolism in a new way. Instead of water, let's substitute liquid methane. And so Titan becomes that place that we would go to look for life, not like us. Our future is in these kind of 
of beautiful objects to interrogate, which is one of the reasons why NASA has selected Dragonfly to be able to go to Titan, land and interrogate that body and make some fabulous observations looking for potential signs of life in that world. Also over the last year or so, we've taken a good look at how we might be able to find more intelligent life by looking at the atmospheres of exoplanets. You know, exoplanets has really exploded. Our knowledge now increased uh, to the point where we now believe there are more exoplanets than there are stars in the galaxy. This gives us a fabulous opportunity with ever increasing missions to be able to interrogate these bodies and look for the potential for life. So if SETI is listening to radio waves, looking for intelligent life, perhaps JWST looking at a very close rocky planet that's Earth size with an atmosphere that may be Earth-like can tease out whether there are indeed some trace gases from intelligent beings on that planet. This is just a tremendously exciting time. And I would like to see in the next five or 10 years, the community move forward and really take the circumstantial evidence that we have so far about life as it may exist beyond Earth and come to more definitive conclusions by making more definitive measurements. We're on the right track. Let's keep it up. Once again, thanks so very much for allowing me to have these few minutes to encourage you along and make this a wonderful conference. Thank you. So Jim and I have a bet where we will find life first, but I'm not going to reveal what the positions are. Thank you for inviting me to participate in today's activities celebrating the NAI's 20 years of accomplishments. I'm Dr. Lori Glaze, the director of NASA's Planetary Science Division, and I am pleased to be able to virtually address you today. The search for life beyond Earth has been a goal of NASA since its beginnings. We have led and inspired the global space community in efforts to understand the origin, evolution, and distribution of life in the universe. One of NASA's greatest contributions was the establishment of NASA's Astrobiology Institute. The NAI created the field of astrobiology by bringing together researchers from disparate fields and guiding them towards collaborations that would lead to more profound and impactful discoveries than ever before. Today, astrobiology is an established field of study recognized worldwide. The NAI was essential in amassing a passionate and dedicated interdisciplinary community of researchers necessary for the grand challenge of finding life elsewhere. You've heard from many people today about the role of NAI scientists in furthering our understanding of how Earth transitioned from an abiotic to a thriving living planet. In exploring the current diversity of life on Earth to better predict other environments in our solar system that could support life as we know it and even as we don't. And in documenting the distribution and chemistry of organics in space to support the idea that we are not alone in the universe. In the coming decades, we'll send robotic and human explorers to join the missions already out there and continue answering questions about the distribution of life in the universe. The work of the NAI has laid the foundation and the astrobiology program at NASA is ready for the next stage. Continued exploration of Mars, Europa, Titan, and other worlds in our solar system and beyond may hold more clues to the origins and potential for life. Thank you for all you have done and will do. Our work has just begun and we will continue to build on the NAI's legacy. The future is just beginning. Uh,
Okay. I'll have to do the timer for you because this is being shown. Okay. And then the oh, I see it. Will... Okay, that's fine. Yeah, because I can. Well, here, I'll just try to time myself here. Okay. All right. Uh, so I'm the penultimate speaker here. So I wanted to, um, first of all, give you, like I said, I'm the science director here at Ames that covers space science, earth science, and biological sciences. I'm not an astrobiologist by training, I'm an astrophysicist. And so I've got some observations on what I think are the biggest transformations that have been catalyzed by astrobiology in the last decade, but I really want to focus on the future. And my choice of the title here is purposeful. And uh, like Lindsay, I paid attention to punctuation. And so uh, you'll see why I had this curious choice about halfway through my talk. Now, the beauty of going uh, late in the day is I have way too many slides for my available time slots, but a slot, but half of them have already been presented. So let me start with this one. So every year, NASA passes, uh, Congress passes an appropriations bill for NASA, but it does not always pass an authorization bill. It does that every few years. And I think Mary alluded to this uh, back in 2017, the NASA authorization bill. Uh, here are the excerpts, and I've highlighted in red a phrase that probably sounds very familiar to you, and it, of course, is up here on the banner also. My friends, that's the definition of astrobiology. And so, as Mary said, when the Space Act created this federal agency back in 1958, there were eight things Congress wanted NASA to do. A ninth was added sometime in the late 90s, something to do with technology transfer, and now this tenth reason for existence for NASA. So I like to tell people astrobiology, it's the law. Uh, we, we heard this morning uh, fascinating uh, personal anecdotes about the establishment of NAI in the early days of exobiology and astrobiology. I do not intend to go through this slide. By the way, my technique is I put together a lot of slides, mostly as page candy. Uh, to support a, a narrative that I just want to weave through in and out of the slides. And so, uh, but I did want to recommend this book if you haven't read it. I think it's uh, by Stephen uh, Dick, who's the former NASA chief historian. And it's a really a, a lively uh, description of the birth of exobiology and astrobiology. I really like this book. And uh, I won't go through the steps here because we've heard about many of them already. I won't go through this in any detail other than to state that a recent uh, agency activity, it went by TCAT, ASAP, uh, who knows how many other acronyms, but in December of 2017, it published a document that tried to explain what each of the nine NASA centers do plus JPL. And it involved, and the primary purpose was to uh, reduce overlaps, not to eliminate them. And so part of that, uh, in, as part of that codification of roles and responsibilities across the NASA centers, Ames was designated as the primary center for astrobiology with the significant efforts at Goddard and JPL in a supporting role. And so here is kind of an overview of what we do here at Ames in astrobiology scattered across various uh, organizations combination of research, technology, and instrumentation development, and increasingly, and we've heard of this repeatedly this morning, uh, infusion of astrobiology into flight projects. And so the ones in green have actually flown. Uh, the ones in Mars are proposed. I will return to those briefly uh, coming up. I think a lot of us, uh, and, and I remember the early days, uh, well, I remember five years after the birth of astrobiology, that's when I came here, uh, the mandate was to, as I said, infuse the intellectual um, uh, underpinnings of astrobiology to define science requirements and to create missions that would be astrobiology missions. And I think many of us forget the first astrobiology mission actually dates from 2010. It was a 3U, cube, a 3U CubeSat developed here at Ames. And it flew two payloads, one that was focused on fundamental space biology, one on astrobiology. And it was a technology demonstrator, but it was also a long, uh, another uh, element in a long line of CubeSat satellites that Ames had flown about this time, many of them uh, catalyzed and funded by uh, life and physical sciences at NASA headquarters. And then, of course, you know, the, 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 the prime narrative in, in searching for life really uh, has been centered on Mars for a long time for justifiable reasons. 
Uh, you know, I don't need to remind you of the results here from Phoenix, Mars Express, MRO. And, you know, what we're finding is that uh, Mars is still a compelling destination, not only at high polar latitudes for exploring ice, frozen ice, water ice, carbon dioxide ice. And so I think that will continue to be a primary uh, goal. And of course, we've made significant progress in the last even 10 years. And I think with uh, the Curiosity rover and Gale Crater and this cover story in science from uh, five plus years ago uh, featured a whole slew of articles on the habitability of Gale Crater. And much, and many of the results were based on the X-ray diffraction uh, Kemen experiment that Dave Blake here at Ames um, um, designed and built. And so it has revolutionized our knowledge, I think, of the habitability. It was the natural final step of following the water. Uh, but as you'll see, I think you saw earlier today, it's time to move beyond that and to uh, not just explore habitability, but to actually search for life, whether it be extant or uh, extinct. Here is kind of an overview of the Mars program uh, from a a slide I took from Dave DeMarais. Ames has been significantly involved in, uh, in some of these missions, uh, the rover, uh, the Spirit and Opportunity rovers, MRO, Curiosity. And um, so you can see that the pace of missions is going to be slowing down. And one of the things that I think is going to be fascinating to see how it plays out in the next decade is Mars sample return. Uh, Thomas Zurbuchen thinks big doesn't think foolishly, thinks big. And he wants NASA to do big and bold things. And I think one example, I'll come back to a second one, but one example of that philosophy is his decision to expedite Mars sample return, do it in fewer missions. Now keep in mind that was the top priority of the decade survey almost 10 years ago, but the, as, as it was constructed originally, it would have required basically to become to be anointed as the top decade survey priority for three decades running. And that's a risky political proposition. And so if you do game theory, I don't think you would count on that. And so Thomas is trying to expedite Mars sample return. And that is his highest priority in the SMD budget that was proposed to the president back a year plus ago. It is the FY20 budgets. It's still currently in debate in Congress. So we'll see what pops out of that. But one of the things I'll be looking at is whether MSR sucks the oxygen out of the atmosphere and prevents any other Mars missions from being done in the next 10 or 15 years. Um, I hope not, but uh, we will see. Uh, one of the missions that uh, we have proposed here at Ames, and we just submitted it as a discovery concept, is the mission called Icebreaker. Uh, I think Alfonso will follow me and go into more details on this mission, so I'm not going to go into a whole lot of details. It's led by Chris McKay. It's a partnership with Goddard Space Flight Center. And the idea here is to return to the Phoenix site, basically, where you can see from the upper picture here in the upper center that, you know, we... You could see frozen ice right on the surface or within a few centimeters of the surface. And the idea is to go drill about a, a meter deep and see what we find. So Alfonso will talk more about that. There's a new, another new mission concept which I'm in, increasingly intrigued by. So does anybody know what this stands for? Come on, Mary Beth. This is the Egyptian cuneiform for Abzu, which is an underground body of water and the deity that represents that body of water. So I'm a full service science provider, Mary Beth. So she proposed a, there was a concept study just to flesh out some interesting new missions uh, above the discovery class. And I didn't think a Mars mission would get selected. This one was not selected. There were only 10 or so selections out of 50 some proposals. So it was heavily oversubscribed. But uh, I was struck by, and I've excerpted and read some of the language from the evaluation. So this concept was deemed to be very scientifically compelling. And it's a mission that really takes a different approach to looking for life on Mars. Uh, proposes to go to you know, a uh, Noachian era body of water former body of water, look at the sedimentary materials, try to find fossils, and to look at uh, lipids and uh, these uh, insoluble macromolecules. And so I think it's an intriguing concept that people haven't pursued. And so I think if anything can wedge itself into the Mars uh, future program, uh, I think this has a possibility. 
Now, in my opinion, and again, this is the opinion of an astrophysicist, I think the biggest development in this whole field in the last five or 10 years is the recognition that Mars is not the sole opportunity for looking for life in the solar system. There are many other targets that are amenable. Uh, and uh, of course, we've all heard about the ocean worlds. Uh, SMD displayed, in my opinion, extraordinary flexibility mid-decade when they declared that ocean worlds could be proposed in the last New Frontiers competition. Usually they lock into a decade survey and don't change their thinking for another 10 years. My perception, I can say that because I worked at SMD, albeit 30 years ago. Uh, but I'm struck by this whole fascination and, and attention to ocean worlds now. And other speakers earlier today have talked about why these are important. And I will note on this chart that in the middle, we have a mission, Europa Clipper, a multi-billion dollar flagship mission out of JPL going to Europa. Uh, and then more recently, Dragonfly selected uh, to go to Titan. I'll have more on that in just a minute. And then locally here, we have a proposal that's uh, scientifically led out of uh, Ames, but is uh, project managed out of Goddard with significant involvement of APL. This is a result of a strategic collaboration I established with APL and Goddard many years ago. Uh, and this proposal did remarkably well for the first time out of the shoot. I'll have more to say about that in a minute. So here's kind of left to right the landscape. Uh, uh, I personally, uh, even as an astrophysicist, have my uh, favorite uh, destination for life detection, which I'm not going to reveal here. Um, I will say that um, I don't want to get caught in those wars. We're astrobiologists, right? We want it all. We want missions to all of these destinations. And so in my opinion, and, and I've asked Penny uh, Boston to coordinate the Ames response to the Planetary Science Decade Survey, I want life detection to be job number one and job number two and job number three in the next decade survey. And um, so I think the time is right. Our understanding of these ocean worlds has progressed enough to identify them as primary targets. I think the technology is catching up. The time is right. Let's go do it. So I've talked about Europa Clipper mission. Uh, I won't say too much about that. Uh, there was an IC2 instrument uh, competition. Uh, I can't remember if it was earlier this year or may have been even in 2018. Uh, two AIMS uh, concepts here were uh, proposed and accepted out of the 14 proposals. Uh, there, uh, that's not the final word on instrumentation for the Europa lander for two reasons. Number one, uh, uh, there will be a further down select. And secondly, as we all know, uh, its major proponent in Congress is no longer in Congress. And so it is almost certain that uh, the Europa lander mission will have to go through revalidation. Actually, it'll have to go through validation. It was never actually recommended in the original decade survey. This was a congressional earmark, if I can use that term. Having said that, a lot of work went into planning this mission. I know Tori Holler here was on the science definition team. I can't see anybody with these bright lights here. Okay, it's somewhere over there. And um, so I hope this mission goes eventually. And we'll see whether these instruments get uh, flowing or not. Uh, as I said, uh, I'm amazed, by the way, to get to almost 4 o'clock. And this is only the second quotation from Carl Sagan that I've seen today. <laughs> and I do want to read it because I really, it's, it's remarkable. It says, on Titan, the molecules that have been raining down like manna from heaven for the last 4 billion years might still be there, largely unaltered, deep frozen, and awaiting the chemists from Earth. Guess what? We're coming. Uh, one downside is even when this mission launches in 2025, it's a 10 year destination. So we're really talking, uh, the chemists are going to have to be patient for another 15 years or so. Uh, but I'm really intrigued by this uh, mission concept. We have a small role here at Ames on the entry, descent, landing, and also science team membership. This is an APL proposal uh, with uh, Zibby. Um, turtle, as was mentioned. I won't go into details here, but this is an example, I think, where Thomas is very bold in deciding that he doesn't want to necessarily do incremental science when you get to the billion dollar class missions. He doesn't want to do stupid things, but uh, you know, the atmosphere is dense there. This uh, dual quadcopter technology has been tested. It's about, uh, don't quote me on this, I think it's about 700 kilograms, so it's a big sucker. And this thing is going to uh, be deployed and uh, hop around. 
uh, and fly around Titan to potentially two and a half dozen sites. And uh, you heard earlier today, somebody described Titan as an early version of Earth, although much colder. And so uh, this is just an incredible mission. And I, and I really give APL credit because they actually had a discovery class version of a proposal to go to Titan and it made it to phase A. And so some really smart people, and probably including some of the people in this room, have thought about how to access the outer solar system on a budget. Uh, I talked about ELSA briefly. Uh, this was a, a remarkable concept, uh, again, led by Chris McKay here at Ames uh, with, in partnership with Goddard and with APL. And this was submitted as a New Frontiers proposal. Uh, the, the remarks, the, the, the evaluation was remarkable for a first time submission. That's all I will say. Uh, I can tell you that I've had private discussions with people at, at headquarters who told me this was almost selected for a phase A study the first time out of the shoot, which is remarkable. So we did receive some technology funding to work on the bio barrier uh, with a sample collection system and to deal with sample contamination issues. It's a low and slow approach, as you can see. Um, let's see, do I have a pointer? Yes, I do. Yeah, uh, it's a low and slow approach, which differentiated it from a competing mission concept from JPL. It would go as low as 20 kilometers, fly at 1.5 kilometers per second. And what I really like about this chart up here is even to the novice like myself, it, it symbolically demonstrates a couple of things. Well, one major thing, and that is if you're going to pursue life detection, you've got to take independent lines of attack because if you are bold enough to declare you have found microbial life in the solar system, you better damn be sure that you have done that. And so having a couple of independent different approaches, in this case involving lipids and chirality, uh, is I think a really strong basis for a life detection mission. And yes, we will be resubmitting this proposal in a couple of years. I won't go into this because I think Alfonso will go into it. It does include instrumentation from Goddard and Ames and a couple of other partners. Now I want to take a step back in the time machine and we've been talking about missions. Uh, I've been talking about missions. Again, this is an observation from somebody outside the field. So I was paging through the various roadmaps and strategic plans that David talked about this morning. And here's the original, original one from 1998 uh, that led to the formation of NAI. And it, based on a workshop held here at Ames, David Morrison was heavily involved. And uh, you can see the big questions. How does life begin and develop? Does life exist elsewhere in the universe? And what is life's future on Earth and beyond? And I've highlighted in red here, goal number 10, understand the response of terrestrial life to conditions in space or on other planets. And I highlight that, and here's more on that particular goal, because I feel like this area has been kind of orphaned. And I'm gonna show you evidence of that. Uh, five years later in 23, now our 10 goals have collapsed to seven. Goal number six is uh, life's future on Earth and beyond. You can read objective 6.2 here kind of touches about this whole subject matter. And then five years later, there was a strategic plan printed in the Astrobiology Journal. Uh, Dave DeMarais, uh, Lou Alamandola, Tori Holler, and Andrew Poharil here from Ames contributed to this. And in this document, there's still seven goals. The sixth uh, you can read for yourself here. I've underlined, you know, kind of the forward life in space aspect of this roadmap. And then we get to 2015, and Dave DeMarais went into this in some detail this morning. I love this cover, by the way. Uh, I'd like to have that framed. Um, it is down to six major topics of research. He went, uh, David uh, explained in great detail this morning what constitutes these six main uh, topics. And, um, and then all of a sudden, in section seven is kind of a grab bag of where do we throw everything else from sociology to tangential science. And then within that, uh, down there in section seven, a whole two pages devoted to how does astrobiology relate to other fields and how does it operate in the context of those other efforts. And then buried within that is the relationship between astrobiology and human sp space flight. Now this is, in my opinion, a selection effect. And it's a natural consequence, I think, of the way bu bureaucracies silo themselves. And so, 
we all know that the big questions in astrobiology you know, would require hundreds of millions of dollars to fund and make even more progress than we have. You can only do so much. I get that. And so, in effect, this whole idea of understanding how life in space uh, operates and having a dialogue between what I now call the fundamental space biologists and the astrobiologists, I think, uh, needs a lot of work yet. And I'm going to, and my, one of my goals as the science director is to have Ames be the integrative uh, catalyst for this, because uh, as I mentioned, we do have leadership in the Agency for Astrobiology, and quite frankly, we have leadership in fundamental space biology too. And so here's a favorite chart of mine from Sid Sun that shows on a, on a very logarithmic scale, as you can see, what we know about humans in space and what we don't know, which is this. And so our, the extent of our knowledge on life in space has really been in low Earth orbit. And I think the natural evolution now is to start hitching rides on other avenues beyond ISS, because ISS is not, I mean, we have done a lot of science on ISS. We here at Ames have delivered 57 payloads to ISS. Having said that, it is not, it is not deep space. It's low gravity, but we don't get the high ionizing radiation that you would see on a deep space mission. So um, one thing we are doing here at Ames is building on our uh, 50 plus years of uh, experience in the fundamental space sciences, formerly life sciences. We heard a little bit this morning about how some of this has folded into the early days of astrobiology. Uh, I won't go into this chart. This is kind of an agency chart. But I think uh, the, the items on the bottom of this chart uh, interface, should interface with astrobiology and dialogues ought to be taking place between representatives from these research disciplines. So here, uh, as I did with astrobiology, here's kind of a summary of what we do in space biosciences at Ames. Combination again of research, bioengineering, uh, new uh, science experiments and analytical capabilities that we deliver to ISS and then a whole host of small satellites, including the 2020 launch of BioSentinel, which will be a secondary payload on the first SLS launch. This will be the first time life has gone into cislunar space since the Apollo era. So we all know that uh, um, uh, ISS has, uh, it's interesting, I've been around long enough where, where ISS in Space Station Freedom and, and its various uh, uh, predecessors were nothing more than a, a gray file cabinet back in NASA headquarters when I was there in the early 90s. And now we have this uh, magnificent engineering marvel. And I recall back in the early 90s, the ISS people would come through the well, OSSA, which is what we called the Science Mission Directory back then. And they'd say, can you think of anything good, any interesting ideas to execute on ISS? And of course, we'd come up with some, and then the first thing it'd say is, oh, uh, show me the money. And of course, that was not the way OSSA worked. We tended to build custom hot, rod, hot, custom hot rods to address uh, scientific questions. And so in my mind, that's another huge development in the last 10 or 15 years is the extent to which the science director has moved to more of a capability-driven approach to doing science. And now you'll see somebody like Paul Hertz, the astrophysics division director, brag about the three or four payloads he's got hanging off ISS. So uh, we will continue to operate ISS. There's currently a bill in Congress to extend its life uh, until 2030 with the international partners. But again, it is not deep space, and we need to start thinking beyond that. And so we here at Ames have been leading a campaign, which is now starting to get some traction back in the Space Life and Physical Sciences Division, which is the fifth science division over in the Human Directorate, uh, called Life Beyond LEO. And the idea here is to fly uh, uh, biological science payloads uh, on small sats, on SLS uh, launches. And I'm very intrigued by this whole lunar initiative whether you believe the gateway or, uh, or commercial landers. Uh, I was on a committee that reviewed a number of um, uh, science payload concepts for uh, commercial landers. There were some biology ones in there and some very compelling ones, I must say. And so to the extent, uh, you know, uh, biologists aren't inter interested in going to the moon because it's the moon, they're interested in going there because it is deep space. So I look forward to seeing the extent to which 
the biological sciences can infuse uh, some of what they want to do into this capability-driven approach. I want to return back. I've been talking about missions for obvious reasons uh, because that's where 90% of SMD's budget goes, or 85% anyway. But I do want to return to research because without the foundational research, uh, the missions don't exist. And, uh, and so Lindsay gave an excellent overview this morning of the uh, R, comma, C, and Ns, <laughs> and the RCNs. And so I won't belabor this. I will say that the Nexus uh, RCN, um, I think has been a huge success, uh, but I don't think it could have failed because it, the uh, whole idea was to bring astrobiologists and exobiologists together. And I think that was a slam dunk, uh, not to minimize the amount of work that was required to make that happen. So Natalie Battaglia, who was the Kepler mission scientist before going to UC Santa Cruz, and Jonathan Fortney, who was a postdoc here and is an exoplanet researcher at Santa Cruz, uh, uh, have leadership roles in Nexus. Uh, Tori Holler, as you saw this morning, has a leadership role in Enfold. Uh, David Blake's a member at, of that team, and Scott Sanford in our astrochemistry lab as part of the PC3E effort. And then, you know, uh, uh, I think Tori, uh, it was mentioned that Tori has a, a leadership role in Enfold through something called the Center for Life Detection Science. This is a somewhat old slide. I think it was uh, uh, excerpted from your proposal. So I think the center of gravity has moved to the lower right as opposed to the lower left here. <laughs> but uh, I look forward to uh, um, uh, having Tori uh, step up in this kind of leadership role. This kind of work is really important because one of the points I made to Thomas Zurbuchen is I think SMD has fallen into a trap. And that trap is that competition is the only proxy for existence. That's one trap. And the second trap is that uh, they often tra treat NASA civil servant scientists no different than academics. And yet we don't have the same benefits of the academics, such as uh, you know, salary paid for most of the year. And I'm a firm believer that civil science, we're government scientists. We ought to be fundamentally doing different things at some level than academic scientists. And I think uh, this kind of community service work where you take your PhD, parlay that into research papers, but also develop what I call a science enabling capability, whether it be databases, or you know, analytical techniques is really uh, something more that NASA should be funding NASA scientists to do more of. So I will continue to beat that drum until my arms fall off. One thing I wanted, and I want to close with just a couple of highlights I could have drawn from any countless members of, uh, of the team here at Ames, but I just uh, serendipitously picked uh, from a couple of the early career people that were up here on the stage earlier. So uh, David Smith, who you met earlier, is doing some really unique work in aerobiology research. And he's agnostic about his platforms. He, uh, he uses uh, high altitude balloons, he uses airplanes. I can say that he recently gave a talk to the SMD management team back there, and um, the, uh, the response was just rapturous. And he had at least three of the division directors or their proxies come up to him afterwards and say, what can I do to help? <laughs> and so this is uh, really what Thomas Zurbuchen wants to see, is this more, more of the interdisciplinary research. Uh, using all of the assets available to NASA. Don't get locked into a single methodology for executing your experiments. And I think um, David's very much at the forefront of that. Um, hmm, I thought I had something else in here, I guess not. So let me close. Uh, I, quite frankly, I forgot where I stole this from. But you've seen many manifestations of this uh, taxonomy before. Astrobiology is a very interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary uh, science, and it draws on a lot of expertise. That's what makes it, I think, so fun to be a part of. And I go around the perimeter here and I say, geez, we do all of that at Ames. I suspect at Goddard, you go around the perimeter and say, we do all of that at Goddard. And so I think one of the strengths of astrobiology uh, being practiced at the NASA centers is we have resident expertise in a lot of these areas that can be drawn into this exciting new, relatively new discipline. And my last slide represents a vision I had back in 2013 and it was a vision catalyzed by two things. Uh, number one uh, was SLS. When NASA decided it was going to do SLS, that to me was a sign we were going to deep space. And secondly, uh, it was about the time the National Academy of Sciences came out with a report that uh, heavily criticized the federal government 
for the decrepit state of its laboratories. And I'd like to think that report was written after some of their uh, committee members infiltrated Ames and toured some of our labs. <laughs> And so um, I campaigned with the center um, to um, open a new uh, laboratory building here at Ames. You may have seen it. Uh, we're starting to move equipment in now. We start moving the chemicals and supplies next month and the people in January. But this uh, is a vision where I wanted an open uh, wet chemistry lab to not only um, augment our existing wet chemistry labs, but I wanted this open configuration with some shared major equipment. And I wanted that because as I toured biological sciences labs in the Bay Area, I found out that's how people work these days. And so I set up an internal competition to decide who would go into this new building. And one of my predictions came true. There was a demographic divide, not strictly speaking, but in general, the younger people want to go into this new building, want to uh, practice this kind of open science. Uh, uh, this will be a combination of biosciences, astrobiologists, bioengineering. And so I think I'm really looking forward to this grand experiment in how we do and execute science in these disciplines. And I'm looking for really good things to come out of the people in this new building. So I will pause there. And if there are any burning questions, so that's kind of uh, life through the lens of a astrophysicist at Ames Research Center. Thank you. I just want to make one comment about this notion of astrobiology in 1998 about the future of life, both on Earth and in space. And uh, what we, we sort of tried to do that with the Ames team for a few years, but what ultimately we found out was that people in Earth system science and in life, in, you know, space biology really are directed very much by what they get from headquarters. And uh, if you really want to cross this divide, as you well know, that it sort of has to start at headquarters sort of saying now you guys need to play well together. It's I think it's starting to happen with the Mars program, but that's, I think that's a perspective. You just have to go up the pay grade to where you can compel people to cross that line. Um, I don't disagree with you. I think we can also uh, advocate for that kind of interdisciplinarity. I think the work that David Smith is one example of that. Um, with the U.S. Geological Survey relocating their Western headquarters here to Ames, uh, and they've already relocated about 200 of their researchers. I think I'm already seeing that this is opening up new lines of research in NASA Earth science. And so I look forward to um, parlaying some of that into some new things. So I think you can, it's a pincer movement, right? You want to come up with the good ideas and then convince them that they're stupid to stay in their silos, right? I just wanted to echo it since I was part of that group then that got cut. And what's happened because of the silos at headquarters is that the Europeans have taken that area and run with mission after mission, and we've just been left out. I, you know, I can't even get a trip to go to the team meetings. All right, and let's get to our final talk then. Alfonso uh, Davila will talk about a couple of the mission concepts I mentioned. Take it away, Alfonso. All right, thank you. Thank you, Michael. I'm not going to try to pack two live detection missions in 15 minutes. Uh, I'm not going to try to pack two live detection missions in 15 minutes. It's not possible. And I don't think it's, it, it fits the purpose of these event today, what I, as I was preparing this, this presentation, I was trying to think how, how do these mission concepts that came out of Ames along with other centers, how do they exemplify what the NAI has been and the evolution of astrobiology? So that's what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to talk about. Uh, what do these missions tell us above and beyond the science in terms of astrobiology? By way of um, context, Icebreaker is a mission that would go to Mars, to the northern latitudes of Mars, drill through ground ice and search for evidence of life frozen in the ground. Um, ELSA is a mission that would go to Enceladus, fly through the Enceladus plume, collecting those icy materials that are coming out of the subsurface ocean and search for evidence of life as well. Uh, but the, um, the true significance of these missions beyond the science, I think, 
is that contrary to every other light detection mission that you might have heard of, these are cost-capped competitive missions. Viking was a multi-billion dollar light detection mission. Mars Sample Return, which focuses strongly on, on, on light detection, is going to be a multi-billion dollar multi-mission mission. Euro Europa Lander was, is supposed to be a multi-billion dollar flagship mission. Uh, and that exemplifies the complexity of light detection. ELSA and Icebreaker are missions that were cost capped. Icebreaker was cost capped at $500 million and ELSA was cost capped at $800 million. And we managed to do something that engineers love to say, which is to close a mission when we proposed it. Closing a mission means that you can start with basic fundamental science questions and develop all the technology and architecture and operations and approach and budget that the mission, the mission can be realized in a cost cap. And I think that's the true significance of these missions that uh, are gonna help propel astrobiology, I hope, in the next 20 years. They also, th these two missions, I think also exemplify what the NAI is because they are both the end result of a process and they're also the beginning of a new process. Icebreaker, a lot of people in Icebreaker in the science team were researchers at Ames in the 1980s, in the early 1980s. And these, the science that supports these missions and the, the technology that supports these, these missions would not have been possible without the scientific and technological advances uh, during the past 20, 30 years. And a lot of that is being thanks to the NAI and the support that the NAI has provided. But they're also, for the reasons I'm gonna to try to convince you of, they're also the future because they are, I think they're pathfinders in life detection in the sense that they open up new ways for us to go outside and search for evidence of life. So I, having been through a number of iterations uh, in ELSA and Icebreaker, uh, and having been on the receiving end of review panels, uh, I've, tr I've, I've learned to boil down the, what I think are the big challenges of life detection missions down to at least these three uh, issues. Uh, high expectations. Live detection missions are different from every other mission in that the stakes are very high. Uh, the expectations is that we will change a, part, a scientific paradigm. And to meet those expectations, the requirements imposed by the science community are very high. And uh, the reviews that we get out of those missions can be, uh, out of these review panels can be fairly brutal, if, uh, if you can believe me. Uh, it's not the same level, if, I, I, I don't think it's the same level of, 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 uh, that of requirements, scientific requirements that are imposed on other kinds of missions, which is fine because through trying to meet those really high standards, we've really improved our way of understanding life, life detection, and how to go about searching for life elsewhere. We might have done ourselves a disservice in the astrobiology community when developing life detection concepts in not really in, 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 in not moving away from this idea that life detection missions are binary, yes, no, scientific endeavors, which is common, it's a common uh, issue coming out of people in the astrobiology community and outside of the astrobiology community. You go to search for evidence of life on Mars, either you find it or you don't. And if you don't, we spent, we just wasted $5 million, uh, $500 million or whatever. That is a false approach to astrobiology. I think, uh, Els and Icebreaker are trying to break out away from this conception, this binary conception of life detection. Uh, and that's uh, something that I think we bring to the table. The, the other one is history. I think we can all recognize that the, the science community has developed a number of antibodies against life detection, uh, going all the way back to Viking, um, because we, Viking exemplified what can happen to an exploration program if the result of the mission is negative. As far as you can tell, the Viking results were negative or not. Uh, but that certainly had an impact on the Mars exploration program for decades. Uh, we also know what the results of an ambiguous result can be. Uh, think about 1996 and the, and the Ellen Hills meteorite. That created a huge scientific debate. It spurred the NAI uh, and, and, and a, a new emphasis on astrobiology. Um, and so an ambiguous result is also something that people are very wary of. And a positive result obviously would be a life-changing event. And so <clears throat> history is intermixed in the whole process of, in the whole uh, endeavor of proposing life detection missions. Uh, and the final one is complexity, which equals risk, which in equals cost. The, uh, it's not just a straight, you cannot draw a straight line between missions that seek to 
characterize habitability of an environment by looking at the composition of rocks even uh, or uh, looking at the uh, presence of energy sources or elements and all the different things that people have been talking about in astrobiology to life detection. It's not a step line, it's not a straight line, it's a step function. Because the technology that goes from going to a habitable environment to demonstrating that that environment contain life is remarkably, it's, it's hugely more complicated. Um, that's why existing and past life detection missions have been flagship missions, billion dollar missions. And so when uh, we try to feed all that into competitive cost capped uh, mission programs, we need to face, we, these are the big challenges that we actually, that, that we need to face. So how does Icebreaker and how does ELSA fit in this thing? I think of these two missions as the equivalent of the, uh, the, the, the Tesla Model 3 of astrobiology missions in that they're visionary, you try to pack a lot of vision into an affordable product and they are usually concentrated in the Bay Area. This is, uh, this is what Icebreaker and ELSA are in terms of, I think, in life detection and astrobiology. They're visionary because they're still doing life detection science, but they're trying to do life detection science that it's not a binary yes, no answer. We've, we try to convince reviewers, uh, we haven't succeeded yet, but I think we're getting there, that the science that these missions are gonna produce is not dependent on whether life is present in those environments, that we will learn something whether life is present or not. We will learn it because we're placing life not in the context of this unique entity that might exist or not, but in the larger context of organic evolution that fits well within the uh, paradigms of the, that have been set up by the NAI and the astrobiology community for many years. And so um, we still can do visionary science uh, at low risk, if you will. Um, and they're affordable because we've managed to close the mission because we've developed the scientific rationale and the instrumentation and we've packaged it in uh, observatories that can be flown to those environments uh, for as little as, if you want, $500 million in the case of Icebreaker. That's not, that's, that has an opponent of luck. Uh, Icebreaker, for example, the only way we could fit that, mis that, that mission in a, in a discovery cost cap is because there is an existing platform that has flown to Mars several times, the Phoenix lander from Lockheed Martin, that we could reuse, basically build to print, that would cost us a lot less money than developing a new system. And so uh, opportunity, chance, and op luck is a combination of opportunity meeting chance. And so this is, uh, this, it, it might not be a paradigm that works for every environment. Uh, for the case of Mars and for the specific case of going to the northern latitudes of Mars, it works. But certainly, cost cap missions, discovery missions are a very tough place to search for life. Um, and so, moving forward, um, what I think, um, this, this is the, this is the uh, result of, as I, as I said, this is the result of decades of scientific development, technological development, um, and a more sophisticated thinking about life and how to search for it. Moving forward, I can think of three key elements that I think have been all mentioned today uh, in the near future of how we can continue this effort, um, either through pushing these mission concepts forward or different, idea, different types of missions, um, but which can benefit from the work that we've been done. The first one is continue to propose to all three, well, we can propose to two competitive mission uh, programs, the Discovery and the New Frontiers, but certainly I think we have demonstrated that we can do live detection in cost cap competitive missions. Uh, Discovery, uh, Icebreaker will be, is, is, as we speak, is being considered for funding under the Discovery program. We will know in January whether it gets funding for phase A. As Michael mentioned, ELSA was, was uh, competed three years ago and it got very close, and we will try to compete it again if the conditions uh, allow us. Um, but there is no reason why we shouldn't be proposing new mission concepts. And the fact that Ames has been supporting these type of mission concepts for, for, uh, for a number of decades now is a very important uh, incentive for everybody who's working at Ames to step up and uh, do what it takes to propose these missions. Uh, the other thing that came to mind when I was, I was listening to the talks today is that through the process of writing these competitive mission pr proposals, uh, you cannot imagine the pain and the suffering that goes into packing, in packaging all these science there and also the learning that goes with it. I've been uh, very lucky to be included at, uh, at an early stage in the development of these mission concepts. 
painfully learning how to translate science into requirements and, uh, and, and applying them into it and, 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 and packaging them in the mission architecture. It's not, a, it's not something you learn out of school. It's not something you learn on your own or reading books. And it's not something you learn in, in two years. It's a, it's, a, it's a process that I think, I'm afraid, at least for somebody as thick as me, as me it's going to take a lifetime to perfect this, especially when we talk about life detection. So it's, this has been an incubator. AIMS has been an incubator for this type of, uh, de for developing this type of mission expertise. And I hope that we keep funding these efforts, even if they're not successful, um, but we keep funding them because we're building that expertise. And eventually, I'm confident that they, we will succeed eventually. The, the other one is something that has been mentioned is the Life Detection Forum. That's a very interesting idea um, for a number of reasons. It's, it's this outlandish idea that scientists, especially astrobiologists, who are notoriously for being squittish and afraid of sharing ideas, often, especially when it comes to life detection, that we can actually bring them together into this open forum where we can discuss and come to an agreement as to what is the best strategy to search for life out there. Um, this is in the early stages, but so far I, I've, uh, I've been involved in, as far as I've been involved, um, it's been a very rewarding uh, exercise. Not only because it's opening up astrobiology to a bigger number of people, it's opening up missions to a, to a larger number of people in the astrobiology community, but it's also shaping the science that eventually we, we want to do. Um, so um, as more people get involved in it, I think it's going to grow. And my hope is that it's going to grow and it's going to set a foundation for life detection missions that is going to last at least uh, a number of decades. And perhaps the most immediate and important one is the upcoming decadal survey, uh, the, 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 the renewed decadal survey for the, uh, for the next decade. And I cannot emphasize how important it is that the astrobiology community rallies around and gets organized so that the, the new document reflects the, uh, the needs and the uh, visions and the desires of that community in terms of life detection. Uh, the decadal is really the document that shapes exploration for the next 10 years. And we're, we're, when we're talking about missions, uh, planetary missions that take 10, 20 years to develop, you cannot wait another 10 years until you start, until you have a decadal that fits the mission profile that you're thinking about. Especially when we're talking about going out to the outer solar system, we're, we're gonna get there in 20, 40 something. Uh, this is the decadal that is gonna allow us to go to Enceladus in the 2040s, this coming decadal. And so, um, there is different ways we can participate in the decadal. Hopefully, Ames can insert some of uh, uh, some key people in the committee, which is where the thing, the, the sausage gets uh, made. Um, some people at Ames will get involved in mission concepts that have been funded from headquarters that will influence the decadal survey. That's another way, to, another way to get involved or to contribute. The third one is to write uh, white papers, community-wide white papers that capture these science ideas that we've been working on and the strategies that we want to uh, tell the community they should emphasize, uh, particularly when it comes to life detection. And so with this, um, if you have specific questions about Icebreaker or ELSA, scientific questions, I'll be happy to address them. Uh, and thank you for your uh, attention. So I wanted to follow up Alfonso's uh, appeal about the Planetary Sciences Decade Survey. So white papers will be solicited in February. I think they're due in May. Uh, many people may wonder, well, you know, what's the format? Uh, it's, they're relatively short. It's free format. Uh, you can talk about science. You can talk about targets. You can talk about missions. You can talk about the health of the profession, all of the above. But when it comes to astrobiology and more specifically life detection, I think back to something David said uh, at Caltech in July at the International Mars Conference. I was at your town hall, in which you had a kickoff meeting on the planetary sciences. Dave has extensive experience on decade surveys. And there's something he said that really stuck with me, and I've been broadcasting it to the people coordinating our response, and that is, why now? We have to emphasize why now? Scientifically, our Knowledge has evolved, as I mentioned earlier. Technology is ready. Um, and so why now? And I think it's a very compelling story. So uh, I know we have time. Uh, there was time on the agenda for discussion. I think it was really just uh, a slop time here. So let me see if there's any questions uh, for any of the speakers, the, the few that remain here. 
just want to make a comment really in response to Alfonso's approach. I think his presentation was really the most important way of addressing these missions and life detection. And that this, uh, you don't want to have a yes, no situation set up. You know, we were facing that in the, in the late seventies and eighties with Mars after the Viking thing where, you know, there was this perception of no. Uh, and what we learned, uh, first of all, that you, every mission isn't going to be the one that, like Indiana Jones, grabs the gold idol and runs back home. Uh, you have to be able to make sure that every mission, even if you can't say yes, uh, it maybe opens the idea of maybe, and because of where I went, I made a bunch of measurements that helped me fine-tune the approach so that the next mission gets closer. And one of the great breakthroughs with the Mars program was that people got excited about rovers driving around, even if they weren't doing life detection. They were just excited about exploring. And so I think the key point here with respect to payloads that go to do life detection is that if you don't detect life, you've, de you've measured other things that tell you about the environment or whatever that maybe makes you smarter about a, a follow-up mission to go to a better place, which was what the Mars program has been all about and why I'm so excited about the 2020 mission going to Jezero Crater. Uh, so I think the key point with life detection missions is to get science value out of that mission, even if you don't you know, convince that you've detected life, because uh, that's just gonna make you smarter down the road and you just have to realize that this is a challenging thing to do and it, it's an iterative approach, just like 10 Apollo missions before we landed on the moon. We have to think of it as an iterative approach so that every mission whether or not it's conclusively detecting life still builds the edifice of knowledge. Yes, over on the other side. Um, I thought of this question during the early career talk, but it could be for any of the speakers. Um, something that kept coming up was uh, sort of now we're at the point in astrobiology where finding life or being able to go to these places and look for life is a possibility and then you know, the question comes, if we find it, what next? Um, and so uh, the question I was wondering is, how do the humanities play into that sort of second stage of preparing for the possibility of finding life, whether that be philosophy or anthropology or sociology or even theology? Um, so if anyone wanted to comment on that. Well, I'm going to ask Lindsay if she has any comments. I suspect back at headquarters, you have had some discussions, maybe at the bar next door, about how you would handle the sociology of any discovery of life. Um, so, so I, you know, I would say that that this is certainly something that's important. This is certainly something that um, some of our the the Barry Bloomberg Chair, Astrobiology Library of Congress Chair. Um, this is you know things that have been discussed with that in in that role and those kinds of things. Um, it's something that that is certainly in, important, um, and that we've had discussions about. And you know, it's it's a it's a part of astrobiology. Um, you know, less fundamental to the science, but but certainly an important part. I'll just say nobody really mentioned planetary protection. That's one of those things that was the operating principles. And I think we have an opportunity. So recently there was the uh, Planetary Protection Independent Review Board studies and it said there's a lot of uh, work to be done to update policies and activities. And one area where people have been saying this for a while is the, the approach before was follow the water. The approach now is sort of follow the organics and the biological, biochemical complexity. And what you have is the opportunity to do new technologies. So that's one of the things that came up. So how do you bring omics and new um, technological approaches to, to do, help your science at the same time that you're ensuring the public that if you bring things back, you know what you're bringing back. And the whole idea of containment, too. Containment, you contain things because you want to have something that is um, verifiable scientifically. You don't want to mess up your samples before you bring them home. And um, also the international community that is not NASA will be asking, what are you bringing back? So I think there's an opportunity to work with commercial space as, as well as the astrobiology community um, to think ahead together. So I would just say from my career looking at astrobiology and planetary protection and this sociology and such, um, 
there are people out there in the theological and other communities who are asking these questions. They are very, if we find life on Mars and it's different than life as we know it, is that a second Genesis? Let me tell you, that's a fascinating question mm -hmm. to a theologian. And there are people out there, the theologians and scientists who are working on these things. So don't fight it. Planetary protection is something that's saying, we want to do this and do the science very well. And oh, by the way, we live on this planet too. We want to make sure we bring it back properly. So um, it's not a bad idea to think about science as well as the implementation all around. Yeah. I'm actually surprised planetary protection did not come up explicitly earlier today. I think this revisit by the Stern Committee was probably long overdue. Uh, I think most scientists would feel that way. Uh, to me, I think one of the more fascinating things to watch in the next five to 10 years is in fact uh, the commercials and the extent to which they abide or do not uh, by planetary protection protocols. I will say that SpaceX has some rather grand plans uh, of sending uh, the Starship or whatever it's called to Mars. Uh, I will tell you, I can't go into a lot of details that some of the Ames people have been invited uh, to some of these workshops in which they're planning resource prospecting. Uh, they're looking for science to take with them. And it's fascinating that when the subject of planetary protection is brought forward, um, there's not much discussion. And that worries me because I wonder if they're either not paying it attention or they are and they're just not willing to reveal their plans. They tend to be very secretive. That's why these invitation only workshops are not supposed to be widely publicized. But I can tell you, if I were a betting man, and I am, uh, uh, they will get to Mars before NASA does. Well, going to, for instance, the moon fits in. You can get a lot of, for instance, speed forward opportunities on the moon for technology or just as you can in the polar regions on the Earth. We do a lot of astrobiology research here too. So it's to work with them at the same time and to tell them that it's, um, there's a technology opportunities as well. Uh, Tori and then Bill. Yeah, I just wanted to try to, to briefly address the last question. So there is an activity ongoing now that involves a handful of people from Ames as well as from, from other groups and centers that's trying to address a little bit of what you're talking about. So, so it looks at the question of how do you manage expectations about the process? How do you sustain some excitement in what is ultimately going to be a long process that, that is not yes or no, that, that you know, constantly evolves? And that does include people, um, both scientists, but also public relations people, so that we can try to understand each other's perspective and create a set of internal resources that allow us to think this through in a systematic way. What do you do when that announcement actually gets made, but what have you done in the time intervening so that you've created the right context when that announcement is made? So, so it certainly is being thought about in a systematic way. Yeah, also just to add, um, to that, there's there's a woman named uh, Catherine Deming at York University. I don't know if you're familiar with her or not, but she's this is a um, an area that she's very much involved with, both in terms of astrobiology, but also in terms of SETI and techno signature works and the you know response of of the humanities and sociology and theological uh, communities to you know a detection etc. So there there are people doing that kind of thing. I can connect you with with Catherine if you like, but. I remember, uh, I, I think it was when the Israeli probe uh, crashed into the moon, uh, whichever one had the tardigrades on it, like there was, uh, you know, a little bit of a, a kerfuffle about like tardigrades on the moon, not a good thing. Um, but if, if a place is deemed to be lifeless or dead or whatever the right term is, um, are there any protocols or discussions about intentionally seeding it with life and just seeing what happens? Like let's put some amoebas or sharks or whales up there and see what, what happens. If nobody offers to take this question, I'm going to offer it to Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> that was a very interesting one with the tardigrades because it is whether you call it a category one or a category two in terms of planetary protection, you don't, somebody put something up there. When the U.S. signed the Outer Space Treaty, they agreed through the Department of State that all of the United States would worry about this. In that case, um, as I understand it, the person who included that, that, uh, that uh, payload 
didn't disclose it. So what do you do? You know, you can't go down and give them a ticket <laughs> because they did something wrong. And so that's why the planetary protection issues are so important. And especially right now, there are some people who would love to go back to some of the Apollo sites, for instance, because they have, they left behind a lot of waste, including diapers, which had microbes, no doubt. And it would be really interesting to go back and find out what's there. So there's a lot of science that could be ruined by people doing things that are inappropriate. It doesn't stop missions. And that's the important thing to know. Work with the group. It's a science group that works on how do we implement it. And nothing says you can't do it. It says let's do it right in ways that, that respect the science and respect the other agencies and international agreements that we have. So there are people studying it. And even uh, as Bill mentioned, Catherine Denning up at York, there are this coming January, Jose Fuenes, who used to be the Vatican observer, observer. He's a Jesuit priest and he's coming to NASA Ames. And he's already been in touch. And so these questions are things that are taken on scientifically as well as in other areas. So don't, don't fight it. Stick with it. It's like trying to do clean air or clean water. Okay, you can't flush your toilets anymore. Ah, that's not a good way to do clean water. No clean air. Okay, shut down all the power plants and no driving cars. It doesn't work that way. It's a matter of risk and costs and decision making. And we do that all the time. Okay. So I want to close by uh, just acknowledging the remarkable accomplishments of the NASA Astrobiology Program writ large and with the NASA Astrobiology Institute in particular. Uh, I like to think of this as a, uh, what do they call it, New Orleans funeral, uh, where we celebrate, right? We don't mourn. Uh, I want to thank uh, the people who were hardy enough to attend this today. Uh, I want to thank John Rask for uh, organizing this. I want to thank our executive council members from the NAI who stayed over for an additional day. I think you're the primary reason Dave Korsmeyer decided we would proceed full speed ahead today rather than delay this until next summer, which is what I proposed. Uh, I'm glad we did it. Uh, I want to thank each and every one of you for participating in this grand endeavor. And I'm going to predict that some subset of people in this room will be the first people in history to discover life beyond Earth. Thank you very much. <laughs>